Hello again. Uh, this is Leah. We're going to hop right back to it uh, for Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. We're going to be doing chapters 11 and 12. So I'm going to try and pick up the pace on the uploads. I know with the break that was that was kind of long. Uh, but we got basically just about 10 chapters to go, and, and we're basically halfway through. So it's it's been a good trip. But, um, yeah, let's get going. All right. Chapter 11. I'd often wondered what old Dan would do if little Ann got into some kind of predicament. One night, I got my answer. For several days, a northern blizzard had been blowing. It was a bad one. The temperature dropped down to ten below. The storm started with a slow, cold drizzle and then sleet. When the wind started blowing, everything froze, leaving the ground as slick as glass. Trapped indoors, I was as nervous as a fish out of water. I told Mama I guessed it was just going to storm all winter. She laughed and said, I don't think it will, but it does look like it'll last for a while. She ruffled up my hair and kissed me between the eyes. This did rile me up. I didn't like to be kissed like that. It seemed that I could practically rub my skin off and still feel it. All wet and sticky and kind of burning. (laughs) Sometime on the fifth night, the storm blew itself out and it snowed near three inches. The next morning, I went out to my doghouse. Scraping the snow away from the two-way door, I stuck my head in. It was as warm as an oven. I got my face washed all over by little Ann. Old Dan's tail thumped out of tune on the wall. I told them to be ready because we were going hunting that night. I heard the old old ringtails would be hungry and stern, for they had been dinned up during the storm. That evening, as I was leaving the house, Papa said, Billy, be careful tonight. It's slick down under the snow, and it will be easy to twist an ankle or break a leg. I told him I would, and that I wasn't going far, just down back of our fields in the bottoms. Well, anyway, he said, be careful. There be no moon tonight, and you're going to see some fog next to the river. Walking through our fields, I saw my father was right about it being slick and dark. Several times I slipped and sat down. I couldn't see anything beyond the glow of my lantern, but I wasn't worried. My light was a good one, and Mama had insisted that I make two little leather pouches to cover the blades of my axe. Aww. Just before I reached the timber, old Dan shook the snow from the underbrush with his deep voice. I stopped and listened. He bawled again. The deep bass tones rolled around the tall sycamores and tore their way out of the thick timber, traveled out all over the fields, and slammed up against the foothills. There, they seemed to break up and die away in the mountains. Old Dan was working the trail slowly, and I knew why. He would never line out until little Ann was running by his side. I thought she would never get there. When she did, her beautiful voice made the blood pound in my temples. I felt the excitement of the hunt as it ate its way into my body. Taking a deep breath, I reared back and whooped as loud as I could. Woo! The coon ran up river for a way, and then, cutting out of the bottoms, he headed for the mountains. I stood and listened until their voices went out of hearing. Slipping and sliding, I started in the direction I had last heard them. About halfway to the foothills, I heard them coming back. Somewhere in the rugged mountains, the coon had turned and headed towards the river. It was about time for him to play out a few tricks, and I was wondering what he was going to do. I knew it would be hard for him to hide his trail with snow on the ground, and I realized later that the smart old coon knew this, too. As the voices of my dogs grew louder, I could tell that they were coming straight towards me. Once, I started to blow out my lantern, thinking that maybe I could see them when they crossed our field, but I realized I didn't stand a chance of seeing the race in the skunk black night. Down out of the mountains, they brought him, singing a hound dog song on his heels. The coon must have scented me, or seen my lantern. He cut to my right and ran between our house and me. I heard screaming and yelling from my sisters. My father started whooping. I knew my whole family was out on the porch listening to the beautiful voices of my little red hounds. I felt as tall as the tallest sycamore on the riverbank. I yelled as loud as I could. 
Again, I heard the squealing of my sisters and the shouts of my father. The deep, oh, 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 of old Dan and the sharp, ow, 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 of little Anne bored a hole in the inky black night. The vibrations rolled and quivered in the icy silence. The coon was heading for the river. I could tell my dogs were crowding him and wondered if he'd make it to the water. I was hoping he wouldn't, for I didn't want to wade the cold water unless I had to do it. I figured the smart old coon had a reason for turning and coming back to the river and wondered what trick he had in mind. I remembered something my grandfather had told me. He said, Never underestimate the cunning of an old river coon. When the nights are dark and the ground is frozen and slick, they can pull some mean tricks on a hound. Sometimes the tricks can be fatal. I was halfway through the fog-covered bottoms when the voices of my dog stopped. I stood still, waited, and listened. A cold silence settled over the bottoms. I could hear the snap and crack of sap-frozen limbs. From far back in the flinty hills, the long, lonesome howl of a timber wolf floated down in the silent night. Across the river, I heard a cow moo. I knew the sound was coming from the Lowry place. Not being able to hear the voices of my dogs gave me an uncomfortable feeling. I whooped and waited for one of them to bawl. As I stood waiting, I realized something was different in the bottoms. Something was missing. I wasn't worried about my dogs. I figured that the coon had pulled some trick and sooner or later they would unravel the trail. But the feeling that something was just not right had me worried. I whooped several times but still could get no answer. Stumbling, slipping, and sliding, I started on. Reaching the river, I saw it was frozen over. I realized what my strange, uneasy feeling was. I had not been able to hear the sound of the water. As I stood listening, I heard a gurgling out in the middle of the stream. The water wasn't frozen all the way across. The still eddy waters next to the bank had frozen, but out in the middle, where the current was swift, the water was running, leaving a a trough in the ice pack. The gurgling sound I heard was the swift current as it sucked its way through the channel. The last time I heard my dogs, they were downstream from me. I walked on, listening. I hadn't gone far when I heard old Dan. What I heard froze the blood in my veins. He wasn't bawling on a trail or giving the tree bark. It was one long, continuous cry. In his deep voice, there seemed to be a pleading cry for help. Scared, worried, and with my heart beating like a churn dasher, I started towards the sound. I almost passed him, but with another cry, he let me know where he was. He was out on the ice pack. I couldn't see him for the fog. I called to him, and he answered with a low whine. Again, I called his name. This time he came to me. He wasn't the same dog. His tail was between his legs and his head was bowed down. He stopped about seven feet from me. Sitting down on the ice, he raised his head and howled the most mournful cry I had ever heard. Turning around, he trotted back out on the ice and disappeared in the fog. I knew something had happened to little Anne. I called her name. She answered with a pleading cry. Although I couldn't see her, I guessed what had happened. The coon had led them to the river. Running out on the ice, he had leaped across the trough. My dogs, hot on the trail, had followed. Old Dan, a more powerful dog than Little Ann, had made his leap. Little Ann had not made it. Her small feet had probably slipped on the slick ice, and she had fallen into the icy waters. Old Dan, seeing the fate of his little friend, had quit the chase and come back to help her. The smart old coon had pulled his trick, and a deadly one it was. I had to do something. She would never be able to get out by herself. It was only a matter of time until her body would be paralyzed by the freezing water. Laying my axe down, I held my lantern out in front of me and stepped back on the ice. It started cracking and popping. I jumped back to the bank. Although it was thick enough to hold the lot weight of my dogs, it would never hold me. Little Ann started whining and begging for help. I went all to pieces and started crying. Something had to be done, and done quickly, or my little dog was lost. I thought of running home for a rope or for my father, but I knew she couldn't last until I got back. I was desperate. It is impossible for me to swim in the freezing water. I wouldn't last a minute. She cried again, 
begging for the one thing I couldn't give her. Help. I thought, if only I could see her, maybe I could figure out some way I could help. Looking at my lantern gave me an idea. I ran up the bank about 30 feet, turned, and looked back. I could see the light, not well, but enough for what I had in mind. I grabbed my lantern and axe and ran for the bottoms. I was looking for a stand of wild cane after what seemed like ages. I found it. With the longest one I could find, I hurried back. After it was trimmed and the limber end cut off, I hung the lantern by the handle on the end of it and started easing it out on the ice. I saw old Dan first. He was sitting close to the edge of the, tr- of the trough, looking down. Then I saw her. I groaned at her plight. All I could see was her head and her small front paws. Her claws were spread out and digging into the ice. She knew if she ever lost that hold, she was gone. Old Dan raised his head and howled. Hound though he was, he knew it was the end of the trail for his little pal. I wanted to get my light as close to little Anne as I could, but my pole was a good eight feet short. Setting the lantern down, I eased the pole from under the handle. I thought, I'm no better off than I was before. In fact, I'm worse off. Now I can see when the end comes. Little Anne cried again. I saw her claws slip on the ice. Her body settled lower in the water. Old Dan howled and started fidgeting. He knew the end was close. I didn't exactly know when I started out towards my dog. I had only taken two steps when the ice broke. I twisted my body and fell toward the bank. Just as my hand closed on a root, I thought my feet touched bottom, but I wasn't sure. As I pulled myself out, I felt the numbing cold creep over my legs. It looked so hopeless. There didn't seem to be any way I could save her. At the edge of the water stood a large sycamore. I got behind it, anything to blot out that heartbreaking scene. Little Anne, thinking I had deserted her, started crying. I couldn't stand it. I opened my mouth to call old Dan. I wanted to tell him to come on and we'd go home as there was nothing we could do. The words just wouldn't come out. I couldn't utter sound. I lay my face against the icy cold bank of the sycamore. I thought of the prayer I had said when I asked God to help me get two hound pups. I knelt down and sobbed out a prayer. I asked, pleaded for a miracle which would save the life of my little dog. I promised all the things that a young boy could if only he would help me. Still saying my prayer and making promises, I heard a sharp metallic sound. I jumped up and stepped away from the tree. I was sure the noise I heard was made by a rattling chain on the front end of a boat. Shouted, I shouted as loud as I could. Over here, I need help. My dog is drowning. I waited for an answer. All I could hear were the cries of little Anne. Again, I hollered, over here, over on the bank. Can you see my light? I need help. Please hurry. I held my breath, waiting for an answering shout. I shivered from the freezing cold in my wet shoes and overalls. A strain in silence settled over the river. A feathery rustle swished by in the blackness. A flock of low-flying ducks had been disturbed by my loud shouts. I strained my ears for some sound. Now and then I could hear the lapping sound of the ice-cold water as it stirred its way through the trough. I glanced at little Anne. She was still holding on, but I saw her paws were almost at the edge. I knew her time was short. I couldn't figure out what I had heard. The sound was made by metal striking metal, but what was it? What could have caused it? I looked at my axe. It couldn't have made the sound as it was too close to me. The noise had come from out in the river. When I looked at my lantern, I knew that it had made the strange sound. I left the handle standing straight up when I had taken the pole away. Now it was down. For some unknown reason, the stiff wire handle had twisted in the sockets and dropped. As it had fallen, it had struck the metal frame, making the sharp metallic sound I had heard. As I stared at the yellow glow of my light, the last bit of hope faded away. I closed my eyes, intending to pray again for the help I so desperately needed. Then, like a blind and red flash, the message of the lantern bored its way into my brain. There was my miracle. There is the way I would save my little dog. 
and the metallic sound I heard were my instructions. They were so plain I couldn't help but understand them. The bright yellow flame started flickering and dancing. It seemed to be saying, Hurry, you know what to do. Faster than I had ever moved my life, I went to work. With a stick, I measured the water in the hole where my feet had broken through the ice. I was right. My foot had touched bottom. Eighteen inches down, I felt the soft mud. With my pole, I fished the lantern back to the bank. I took the handle off, straightened it out, and bent a hook on one end. With one of my shoelaces, I tied the wire to the end of the cane pole. I left the hook sticking out about six inches beyond the end of it. I started shouting encouragement to little Anne. I told her to hang on and to not to give up, as I was going to save her. She was. She answered with a low cry. With a hook stuck in one of the ventilating holes in the top of my light, I lifted it back out on the ice and set it down. After a little wiggling and pushing, I worked the hook loose and laid the pole down. I took off my clothes, picked up my axe, and stepped down in the hole in the icy water. It came to my knees. Step by step, breaking the ice with my axe, I waded out. The water came up to my hips and then to my waist. The cold bite of it took my breath away. I felt my body grow numb. I couldn't feel my feet at all, but I knew they were moving. When the water reached my armpits, I stopped and worked my pole toward little Ann. Stretching my arms as far as I could, I saw I was still a foot short. Closing my eyes and gritting my teeth, I moved on. The water reached my chin. I was close enough. I started hooking at the collar of little Ann. Time after time, I felt the hook almost catch. I saw I was fishing on a wrong angle. She had settled so low in the water, I couldn't reach her collar. Raising my arms above my head so the pole would be on a slant, I kept hooking and praying. The seconds ticked by. I strained for one more inch. The muscles in my arms grew numb from the weight of the pole. Little Ann's claws slipped again. I thought she was gone. At the very edge of the ice, she caught again. All I could see now were her small red paws and her nose and eyes. By old Dan's actions, I could tell he understood and wanted to help. He ran over close to my pole and started digging at the ice. I whopped him with the cane. That was the only time in my life I ever hit my dog. I had to get him out of the way so I could see what I was doing. Just when I thought my task was impossible, I felt the hook slide under the tough leather. leather. It was none too soon. As gently as I could, I dragged her over the rim of the ice. At first, I thought she was dead. She didn't move. Old Dan started whining and licking her face and ears. She moved her head. I started talking to her. She made an effort to stand but couldn't. Her muscles were paralyzed and the blood had long ceased to flow. At the movement of little Ann, old Dan threw a fit. He started barking and jumping. His long red tail fanned the air. Still holding on to my pole, I tried to take a step backward. My feet would move. A cold, gripping fear came over me. I thought my legs were frozen. I made an e- another effort to lift my leg and moved. I realized that my, f- my feet were stuck in the soft, muddy bottom. I started backing out, dragging the body of my little dog. I couldn't feel the pole in my hands. When my feet touched the icy bank, I couldn't feel that either. All the feeling in my body was gone. I wrapped little Ann in my coat and hurried in, into my clothes. With a pole, I fished my light back. Close by was a large drift. I climbed on top of it and dug a hole down through the ice and snow until I reached the dry limbs. I poured half of the oil in my lantern down into the hole and dropped in a match. In no time, I had a roaring fire. I laid little Ann close to the warm heat and went to work. Old Dan washed her head with his warm red tongue while I massaged and rubbed her body. I could tell by her cries when the blood started circulating. Little by little, her strength came back. I stood her on her feet and started walking her. She was weak and wobbly, but I knew she would live. Oh, I felt much better and breathed out a sigh of relief. After drying myself out the best I could, I took the lantern handle from the pole, bent it back to its original position, and put it back on the lantern. 
Holding the light out in front of me, I looked at it. The bright metal gleamed in the firelight glow. I started talking to it. I said, Thanks, old lantern. More than you'll ever know. I'll always take care of you. Your globe will always be clean, and there will never be any rust or dirt on your frame. I knew if, if it had not been for the miracle of the lantern, my little dog would have met her death on that night. Her grave would have been the cold, icy waters of the Illinois River. Out in the river, I could hear the cold water gurgling in the icy trough. It seemed to be angry. It hissed and growled as it tore its way through the channel. I shudder to think of what could have happened. Before I left for home, I walked back to the sycamore tree. Once again, I said a prayer, but this time the words were different. I didn't ask for a miracle. In every way a young boy could, I said, thank you. My second prayer wasn't said with just words. All my heart and soul was in it. On my way home, I decided not to say anything to my mother and father about little Ann's accident. I knew it would scare Mama, and she might stop my hunting. Reaching our house, I didn't hang the lantern in its usual place. I took it to my room and set it in the corner with the handle standing up. The next morning, I started sneezing and came down with a terrible cold. I told Mama I got my feet wet. She scolded me a little and started doctoring me. For three days and nights, I stayed home. All this while, I kept checking the handle of the lantern. My sisters shook the house from the roof to the floor with their playing and romping, but the handle never did fall. I went to my mother and asked her if God answered prayers every time one was said. She smiled and said, No, Billy, not every time. He only answers the ones that are said from the heart. You have to be sincere and believe in him. She wanted to know why I'd asked. I said, Oh, I just wondered, and, and I wanted to know. She came over and straightened my suspender, saying, That was a very nice question for my little Daniel Boone to ask. Bending over, she started kissing me. I finally squirmed away from her, feeling as wet as a dirt dollar's nest. My mother could never could kiss, kiss me like a fellow should be kissed. Before she was done, I was kissed all over. It always made me feel silly and baby-like. I tried to tell her that a coon hunter wasn't supposed to be kissed that way, but not, Mama never could understand things like that. I stomped out of the house to see how my dogs were. Chapter 12 The fame of my dogs spread all over our part of the Ozarks. They were the best in the country. No coon hunter came into my grandfather's store with as many pelts as I did. Grandpa never overlooked an opportunity to brag. <laughs> he told everyone the story of my dogs and the part he had played in getting them. Many was the time some farmer coming to our home would say, Your grandpa was telling me you got three big coons over in Peavine Hollow the other night. I would listen, knowing I only got one, or maybe none, but grandpa was my pal. If he said I caught ten in one tree, it was just that way. <laughs> because of my grandfather's bragging and his firm belief in my dogs and me, a terrible thing happened. One morning, while having breakfast, Mama said to Papa, I'm almost out of cornmeal. Do you think you could go to the mill today? Papa said, I intended to butcher a hog. We're about out of meat. Looking at me, he said, Shell a sack of corn. Take one of the mules and go to the mill for your mother. With the help of my sisters, we shelled the corn. Throwing it over our mule's back, I started for the store. On arriving at the mill house, I tied my mule to the hitching post, took my corn, and set it by the door. I walked over to the store and told my grandpa I wanted to get some corn ground. He said, I'll be with you in just a minute. As I was waiting, I heard his horse coming. Looking out, I saw who it was and didn't like what I saw. It was the two youngest Pritchard boys. I had run into them on several occasions during pie summers and dances. 
The Pritchards were a large family that lived upriver about five miles. As in most small country communities, there is one family that no one likes. The Pritchards were it. Tales were told that they were bootleggers, thieves, and just all around, no accounts. The story had gotten around that old man Pritchard had killed a man somewhere in Missouri before moving to our part of the country. Reuben was two years older than I, big and husky for his age. He never had much to say. He had mean-looking eyes that were set far back in his rugged face. They were smoky-hued and unblinking, as if the eyelids were paralyzed. I had heard that once he had cut a boy with a knife in a fight over at the sawmill. Rainey was the youngest, about my age. He had the meanest disposition of any boy I had ever known. Because of this, he was disliked by young and old. Wherever Rainey went, trouble seemed to follow. He was always wanting to bet, and would bet on anything. He was nervous, and could never seem to stand still. Once at my grandfather's store, I had given him a piece of candy. Snatching it out of my hand, he ate it, and then sneered at me. Said it wasn't any good. During a pie supper one night, he wanted to bet a dime that he could whip me. My mother told me always to be kind of Rainy, that he couldn't help being the way that he was. I asked, why? She said it was because his brothers were always picking on him and beating him. On entering the store, they stopped and glared at me. Reuben walked over to the counter. Rainy came over to me. Leering at me, he said, I'd like to make a bet with you. I told him I didn't want to bet. He asked if I was scared. No, I just don't want to bet, I said. His neck and ears looked as though they hadn't been washed in months. His ferret-like eyes darted here and there. Glancing down to his hands, I saw the back of his right sleeve was stiff and starchy from the constant wiping of his nose. He saw I was looking him over and asked if I liked what I saw. I started to say no, but didn't. Turned and walked away a few steps. Reuben ordered some chewing tobacco. Aren't you a little too young to be chewing? Grandpa asked. Ain't for me. It's for my dad, Reuben growled. Grandpa had handed two plugs to him. He paid for it, turned around, and handed one plug to Raimi. Holding the other in front of him, he looked it over. Looking at Grandpa, he gnawed at one corner of it. Grandpa mumbled something about how kids were brought up these days. He came from behind the counter, saying to me, Let's go grind that corn. The Pritchard boys made no move to follow us out of the store. Come on, Grandpa said. I'm going to lock up till I get this corn ground. We'll just stay here. I want to look at some of the shirts, said Reuben. No, you won't, said Grandpa. Come on, I'm going to lock up. Begrudgingly, they walked out. I helped Grandpa start the mill, and we proceeded to grind the corn. The Tr- Pritchard boys had followed us and were standing, looking on. Rainy walked over to me. I heard you had some good hounds, he said. I told him I had the best in the country. If he didn't believe me, he could just ask my grandfather. He just leered at me. I don't think they're half as good as you say they are, he said. Bet our blue, old blue tick hound can outhunt both of them. I laughed. Ask Grandpa who brings in the most hides. I wouldn't believe him. He's crooked, he said. I'll let him know right quick that my grandfather wasn't crooked. He a storekeeper, ain't he? He asked. I glanced over at Grandpa. He had heard the remark made by Rainy. His friendly old face was as red as a turkey gobbler's water. The last of my corn was just going through the grinding stone. Grandpa pushed a lever to one side, shutting off the power. He came over and said to Rainy, What do you do? Just go around looking for trouble? What do you want? A fight? Reuben sidled over. This ain't none of your business, he said. Besides, Rainy's not looking for a fight. We just want to make a bet with him. Grandpa glared at Reuben. Any bet you make sure would be a good one, all right. What kind of bet? 
Reuben spat a mouthful of tobacco juice on the clean floor. He said, Well, we've heard so much about them hounds of his. We just think it's a lot of talk and lies. We'd like to make a little bet. Say about two dollars. I had never seen my old grandfather so mad. The red had left his face. In its place was a sickly, paste-gray color. The kind old eyes behind the glasses burned with a fire I had never seen. In a loud voice, he asked, Bet on what? Reuben spat again. Grandpa's eyes followed the brown stain in its arch until it landed on the clean floor and splattered. With a leering leering grin on his dirt, ugly face, Reuben said, Well... We got an old coon up in our part of the country that's been there a long time. Ain't no dog ever been smart enough to tree him, and I... Rainy broke into the conversation. He just ain't no ordinary coon. He's an old-timer. Folks call him the ghost coon. Believe me, he is a ghost. He just runs hounds long enough to get them all warmed up, then climbs a tree and disappears. Our old blue hound had treed him more times than... Reuben told Rainy to shut up and let him do the talking. Looking over at me, he said, What do you say? Want to bet two dollars your hounds can tree him? I looked at my grandfather, but he didn't help me. I told Reuben I didn't want to bet, but I was pretty sure my dogs could tree that ghost coon. Rainy butted in again. What's the matter? You yellow? I felt the hot blood rush into my face. My stomach felt like something alive was crawling in it. I doubled up my right fist and was on point of hitting Rainy in one of his eyes when I felt my grandfather's hand on my shoulder. I looked up. His eyes flashed as he looked at me. A strange little smile was tugging at the corner of his mouth. The big artery in his neck was pounding out and in. It reminded me of a young bird that had fallen out of a nest and lay dying on the ground. Still looking at me, He reached back and took his billfold from his pocket, saying, Let's call that bet. Turning to Reuben, he said, I'm going to let him call your bet. But now you listen. If you boys take him up there to hunt the ghost coon and jump on him and beat him up, you're sure going to hear from me. I don't mean maybe. I'll have you both taken on to Tahlequah and put in jail. You better believe that. Reuben saw he had pushed my grandfather far enough. Backing up a couple of steps, he said, We're not going to jump on him. All we want to do is make a bet. Grandpa handed me two $1 bills, saying to Reuben, You hold your money, and he can hold his. If you lose, you had better pay off. Looking back to me, he said, Son, if you lose, pay off. I nodded my head. I asked Reuben when he wanted me to come up for the hunt. He thought a minute. You know where that old log slide comes out from the hills onto the road, he asked. I nodded. We'll meet you there tomorrow night, about dark, he said. It was fine with me, I said, but I told him not to bring his hounds because mine wouldn't hunt with other dogs. He said he wouldn't. I agreed to bring my axe and lantern. As they turned to leave, Rainy smirked. Sucker, he said. I made no reply. After the Pritchard boys had gone, my grandfather looked at me and said, Son, I have never asked another man for much, but I sure want you to catch that ghost coon. I told him if the ghost coon made one track in the river bottoms, my dog would get him. Grandpa laughed. (laughs) Well, you better be getting home. It's getting late, and your mother is waiting for the cornmeal, he said. I could hear him chuckling as he walked towards his store. I thought to myself, there goes the best grandpa a boy ever had. Lifting the sack of meal to the the back of my old mule, I started for home. All the way, I kept thinking of old Dan, little Ann, ghost coons, and the two ugly, dirty Pritchard boys. I decided not to tell my mother and father anything about the hunt, for I knew Mama wouldn't approve of anything I had to do with the Pritchards. The following evening, I arrived at the designated spot early. I sat down by a red oak to wait. 
I called little Anne over to me and had a good talk with her. I told her how much I loved her, scratched her back, and looked at the pads of her feet. Sweetheart, I said, you must do something for me tonight. I want you to tree the ghost coon, for it means so much to Grandpa and me. She seemed to understand and answered by washing my face and hands. I tried to talk to old Dan, but I may as well have talked to a stump for all the attention he paid me. He kept walking around, sniffing here and there. He couldn't understand why we were waiting. He was wanting to hunt. <laughs> Reuben and Rainy sh showed up just at dark. Both had sneers on their faces. Are you ready? Reuben asked. Yes, I said, and asked him which way was the best to go. Let's go down river away and work up, he said. We're sure to strike him coming up river, and that way we've got the wind in our favor. Are these the hounds that we've been hearing so much about? Rainy asked. I nodded. They look too little to be any good, he said. I told him dynamite came in little packages. He asked me if I had two dollars. Yes, I said. He wanted to see my money. I showed it to him. Reuben, not to be outdone, showed me his. We crossed an old field and entered the river bottoms. By this time, it was quite dark. I lit my lantern and asked which one wanted to carry my axe. It's yours, Rainy said. You carry it. Not wanting to argue, I carried both the lantern and the axe. Rainy started telling me how stingy and crooked my grandfather was. I told him I hadn't come to have any trouble or to fight. All I wanted to do was hunt that ghost coon. If there was going to be any trouble, I would just call my dogs and go home. Reuben had a nickel's worth of sense, but Rainy had none at all. Reuben told him if he didn't shut up, he was going to bloody his nose. That shut Rainy up. Old Dan opened up first. It was a beautiful thing to hear. The deep tones of his voice rolled in the silent night. A bird in a cane break on our right started chirping. A big swamp rabbit came running down the riverbank as if all hell was close to its heels. A bunch of mallards feeding in the shallows across the river took flight with frightened quacks. A feeling that only a hunter knows slowly crept over my body. I whooped to my dogs, urging them on. Little Ann came in. Her bell-like tones blended with old Dan's in perfect rhythm. We stood and listened to the beautiful music, the deep-throated notes of hunting hounds on the hot-scented trail of a river coon. Reuben said, If he crosses the river up at the Buck Ford, it's the ghost coon, as that's the way he always runs. We stood and listened. Sure enough, the voices of my dogs were silent for a few minutes. Old Dan, a more powerful swimmer than Little Ann, was the first to open up after crossing over. She was close behind. Reuben said, that's him all right. That's the ghost coon. They crossed the river again. We waited. Rainy said, you may as well get your money out now. I told him just to wait a while, and I'd show him the ghost coon's hide. This brought a loud laugh from Rainy, which sounded like someone had dropped an in empty bucket on a gravel bar and then had kicked it. The wily old coon crossed the river several times, but couldn't shake my dogs from his trail. He cut out from the bottoms, walked a rail fence, and jumped from it into a thick cane break. He piled into an old slaw. Where it emptied into the river, he swam to the middle. Doing opposite to what most coons do, which is swim downstream, he swam upstream. He stopped at an old drift in the middle of it. Little Ann found him. When she jumped him from the drift, old Dan was far downriver searching for the trail. If he could have gotten there in time, it would have been the last of the ghost coon. But little Ann couldn't do much by herself in the water. He fought his way f free from her and swam to our side and ran upstream. I could hear old Dan coming through the bottoms on the other side, bawling at every jump. I could feel the driving power in his voice. We heard him when he hit the water to cross over. It sounded like a cow had jumped in. <laughs> Little Ann was warming up the, the ghost coon. I could tell by her voice that she was close to him. Reaching our side, old Dan tore out after her. He was a mad hound. His deep voice was telling her he was coming. 
We were trotting along, following my dogs, when I heard little Anne's bawling stop. Wait a minute, I said. I think she's treed him. Let's give her time to circle the tree and make sure he's there. Old Dan opened up ball and treed. Reuben started on. Something's wrong, I said. I can't hear little Anne. Rainy spoke up. Maybe the ghost coon ate her up. I glared at him. Hurrying on, we came to my dogs. Old Dan was bawling at a hole in a large sycamore that had fallen into the river. At that spot, the bank was a good ten feet above the water level. As the big tree had fallen, the roots had been torn and twisted from the ground. The jagged roots, acting as a drag, had stopped it from falling all the way into the stream. The trunk lay on a steep slant from the top of the bank of the water. Looking down, I could see the broken, tangled mass of the top, debris from floods that caught in the limbs, forming a drift. Old Dan was trying to dig and gnaw his way into the log. Pulling him from the hole, I held my lantern up and looked down in the dark hollow. I knew that somewhere down below the surface, there had to be another hole in the trunk, as water had filled the hollow to the river's end. Reuben, looking over my shoulder, said, That coon couldn't be in there. If he was, he'd be drowned. I agreed. Rainy spoke up. You ready to pay off? he asked. I told you them hounds couldn't treat the ghost coon. I told him the show wasn't over. Little Ann had never ball treed, and I knew she wouldn't until she knew exactly where the coon was. Working the bank up and down and not finding the trail, she swam across the river and worked the other side. For a good half hour, she searched that side before she came back across to where old Dan was. She sniffed at the hollow log. We might as well get away from here, Rainy said. They ain't going to find the ghost coon. Sure looks that way, Reuben said. I told them I wasn't giving up until my dogs did. You just want to be stubborn, Reuben said. I'm ready for my money now. I asked him to wait a few minutes. Ain't no use, he said. No hound yet has ever treed that ghost coon. Hearing a whine, I turned around. Little Ann had crawled up on the log and was inching her way down the slick trunk toward the water. I held my lantern up so I could see better. Sprattle-legged, claws digging into the bark, she was easing her way down. You better get her out of there, Reuben said. If she gets down in that old treetop, she'll drown. Reuben didn't know my little Ann. Once her feet slipped, I saw her hindquarters fall off to one side. She didn't get scared. Slowly, she eased her legs back on the log. I made no reply. I just watched and waited. Little Ann eased herself into the water. Swimming to the drift, she started sniffing around. In places, it was thin and her legs would break through. Climbing, clawing, and swimming, she searched the drift over, looking for the lost trail. I saw when she stopped searching. With her body half in the water and her front feet curled over a piece of driftwood, she turned her head and looked towards the shore. I could see her head twisting from side to side. I could tell by her actions that she had gotten the scent. With a low whine, she started back. I told Reuben, I think she smells something. Slowly and carefully, she worked her way through the tangled mass. I lost sight of her when she came close to the undermined bank. She wormed her way o under the overhang. I could hear her clawing and wallowing around, and then all hell broke loose. Out from under the bank came the biggest coon I had ever seen, the ghost coon. He came right out over little Ann. She caught him in the old treetop. I knew she was no match for him in that tangled mass of limbs and logs. He fought his way free and swam for the opposite bank. She was right behind him. Old Dan didn't wait, look, or listen. He piled off the ten-foot bank and disappeared from sight. I looked for him. I knew he was tangled in the debris under the surface. I started to take off my overalls, but stopped when I saw his red head shoot out, out of the water. Balling and clawing his way free of the limbs and logs, he was on his way. On reaching midstream, the ghost coon headed down river with little Ann still on his, tra on his tail. We ran down the riverbank. I could see my dogs clearly in the moonlight. 
The ghost coon was about 15 feet ahead of little Ann. About 25 yards behind them came old Dan, trying so hard to catch up. I whooped to them. Reuben grabbed a pole, saying, He may come out on this side. Knowing the ghost coon was desperate, I wondered what he would do. Reaching a gravel bar below the high bank, we ran out onto it to the water's edge. Then the ghost coon did something that I had never expected. Coming even with us, he turned from midstream and came straight for us. I heard Reuben yell, Here he comes! He churned his way through the shallows and ran right between us. Reuben, Reuben swung his pole, missed the coon, and almost hit little Anne. The coon headed for the river bottoms with her right on his heels. The bawling of little Anne and our screaming and hollering made so much noise, I didn't ho- hear old Dan coming. He tore out of the river, plowed into me, and knocked me down. We ran through the bottoms, following my dogs. I thought the ghost coon was coming, going back to the sycamore log, but he didn't. He ran up river. While hurrying after them, I looked over at Rainy. For once in his life, I think he was excited. He was whooping and screaming and falling over logs and limbs. I felt good all over. Glancing over at me, Rainy said, They ain't got him yet. The ghost coon crossed the river time after time. Seeing that he couldn't shake old Dan and little Ann from his trail, he cut through the river bottoms and ran out into an open field. At this maneuver, Reuben said to Rainy, He's heading for that tree. What tree, I asked. You'll see, said Rainy. When he gets tired, he always heads for that tree. That's where he gets his name, the ghost coon. He just disappears. If he disappears, my dogs will disappear with him, I said. Rainy laughed. I had to admit one thing. The Pritchard boys knew the habits of the ghost coon. I knew he couldn't run all night. He had already far surpassed any coon I had ever chased. They're just about there, said Reuben. Just then I heard old, ban- old Dan bark tree. I waited for little Ann's voice. I didn't hear her. I wondered what it could be this time. He's there, all right, Reuben said. He's in that tree. Well, come on, I said. I want to see that tree. <laughs> you might as well get your money out, Rainy said. I told him he had said that once before, back on the riverbank. And that's where we're going to leave off. Pretty fun cliffhanger, eh? All right. Thank you so much, UNCW, for allowing me the space to record and the equipment. And I'll see you guys later. All right. Bye-bye.